the Gospel of John, chapter 6. I want to just spend a little bit of time here. John, chapter 6. <clears throat> what I want to do is I don't want to, I don't want to really um, <clears throat> try to cover this whole chapter because uh, it's... Uh, like 71 verses. <laughs> what? Yeah, I know. So what we're going to do is we're going to scan and skim our way through here. <clears throat> and uh, the reason why I'm going to do it this way is I want to try to pick out things that are going to help you see how Jesus um, is, is very different than the Christian approach here. He is, he has his heart set on giving the Father something, but to do that, he has to become something. <clears throat> okay? So um, let's, let's, uh, let's do verse 1 and 2 first. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on those who were diseased. Okay, so the first thing to notice is um, that uh, there was a great multitude following Jesus. Um, a great multitude followed him, following him. We, we, like probably the disciples at that moment as this, this was happening, would have assumed that this, this thing, this train, this movement, this thing's gathering momentum, okay? We've got a lot of followers, okay? And, you know, in Christianity, you're not really anything unless you have a lot of followers. And the same true of Facebook. Yeah. Did you... What do you call it? Disgrace book? What? It's faith book. Anyway. Um, um, also, that they follow because of the miracles. All right. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that I, I'm constantly doing this, but I'm trying to shake Christianity out of your tree, and I'm trying to get the heart of the father or the heart of the lamb for a bride um, worked in your your consciousness in the sense of of uh, reading things uh, more as they are than in light of just a Christian religion okay so they're following him for the miracles okay well Christian religion we go yeah Praise God, you know, it's, it's miracles and, and this sort of thing. But really, he sees, and we're going to see that he deals with this. But he sees this is, um, it's to, it, his relating to them is about what he can do for them. You can call it miracles, but it, to him, it's, you're just asking what I can do for you. Okay. Now, I'm telling you, we're going to deal with that as we get down further because he's, you know, some of you know the scripture. He is not going to allow that, but he's going to address what's really going on in his heart and what's really going on in the heart of the Father. Okay, so verse 4. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. So what Jesus is going to do in the process of this chapter is, you remember, you remember later on, it's going to, he's going to really spend a lot of time on eat my flesh and drink my blood, right? So what Jesus is going to do is he's going to explain what God the Father and God the Son, before there was a world, what he meant by Passover. And he's not going to talk about, you know, a, a little animal being slain or whatever, and a certain kind of feast as we understand feast, but it is a feast. 
nonetheless. It is a feast nonetheless. So, and the other thing that we have to realize is it's interesting that he spills this whole thing out on the Passover. So he does everything with purpose. This is not random. Jesus is not random. And we have to realize that. Okay, verse 5 and 6. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to test him, or to prove him, depending on your translation or some other. This he said to test him, for he himself knew what uh, he would do. All right, so how many of you can believe that the Lord tests us to find out where we're at in relationship to this whole, what we call plan of God, or, or desire the Father, or... Christianity. He's finding us in different categories by our responses. And he is. And he does this all the time. We may not even know it. I mean, he does it to us. I mean, you know, and it's not always the big thing of take your son, your only son, and da-da-da-da. He, he's simply testing us to find out what ground we're on with him. Yeah. Why would he do that? Why? I'm, I'm really asking a question. Anybody know? Why would he do that? He's hoping we'll be on the same ground. It, well, he's hoping we'd be on the sound, same ground. Because it means so much to his heart. Because it means so much to his heart. He loves us and wants us with him. He loves us and wants us with him. And, and yes. He wants us to know what ground we're on. He wants us to know he what ground we're on. He wants yes. us to know what ground we're on. We're operating. Yeah, I don't know that Philip figured it out. But anyway, yes. He's looking for the sun and not a child. He's looking for the sun and not a shadow. Not a child. Oh, a child. It's a crybaby. <laughs> <laughs> a crybaby. Or a, you know. We're not going to go there this time. Um, when he's fi trying to find out what we would do, he's actually trying to find out our motives what we know of him or don't know of him, all of the things that you've said, which were all, all correct answers, because God is not one-dimensional. Amen? All right. So, um, but, but it says this, that he already knew what he was going to do. He knows what he's going to do. It's going to be for others. He already knows that. He doesn't have to go, well, I wonder what I'm going to do. Or he doesn't have to go, I wonder what the Father wants me to do. They're one. Can you believe that oneness can actually work in a being where you don't have to seek the will of God? You know the heart of God. Now, and then don't misunderstand that. I'm not saying that there's not things for direction in your life or da-da-da-da or, Lord, should I go to, uh, out on this outreach or not. I think it's fine. But there are greater things within many of them, maybe not all of them, but within many of them, should I go on this outreach or not? What is our, why are we asking that question? Is it because we're conflicted or there's two options maybe? One is I'd rather not because da 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 da. The other one is you would want me to by your nature for others to manifest your son. But we're asking the will of God. You see that? We're asking the will of God when we should, we should know something beyond the will of God. We should know the heart of God. And as such, if we're an earthen vessel, then we've got a treasure within us. And anywhere we go, it should be about delivering, you know, we're a delivery system. We should be about delivering the Son to, to others. Or being there just because the Father wants it. And sometimes that's the case. Sometimes it has nothing to do with a great uh, accomplishment in being there. You know, you know I, again, I'm, I, this is me, and I you know, don't ever expect you to listen to me, but I personally, th I really think that there is this truth that when everything would be seen, for example, in this room, through 
God and Satan on a certain front, um, let's just take Satan. He would look at it and he goes, okay, um, you know, he go light, 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 darkness, darkness, light, darkness, light, shadowy, uh, you know, no. I mean, it'd be darkness or light. It would be Christ as light or just the absence of Christ as life. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and I'm not saying that the ones I pointed to or any of that. I'm just trying to use that as an example. So if you won the lottery by me pointing to you as life, that doesn't mean that that's what we're talking about. Um, so would it be possible to go somewhere and just be light or be salt? You're the light of the world. You're the salt of the earth. Just be light and salt. Okay. So, so where would that come up in the, in the prayer for the will of God? <laughs> you know, Lord, what's your will? Should I go or not? He goes, you, everything you do, you're supposed to be light and salt. It's like, okay, well, you still didn't answer. Well, is laying in your bed watching The Bachelor? <laughs> or The Bachelorette? I don't even, I wouldn't know which one to watch. I, just, I don't know. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. You should see me with a remote. I know how to find the will of God. You're out of here. Anyway, um, so uh, verse 10. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. Praise God. And uh, that's, that's a joke, people. Uh, so... <laughs> So the men, yeah, I didn't put it in the word. <laughs> so, uh, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. All right. So we can assume that there were women and children there also. So, but we're going to stick with 5,000. All right. So verse 11 <clears throat> And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the dis, uh, disciples to them that were sitting down, and likewise of the fishes, much as they would. Much as they would. He gave them as much as they wanted. All right. Now, don't think in terms of a miracle. Think in terms of how the Father relates to the son and the son to the father and how that manifests out to us when it comes to satisfaction he met their satisfaction as much as they would as much as they wanted or much as much as they would allow or whatever but he he met that that satisfaction or need but it, but let's let's say if you were really hungry then you would need to eat but is it possible to also eat until you're satisfied see both of those are possible all right and so Jesus's heart isn't just to meet the need because it's that nature that works in him <clears throat> so he gives us as much as we want. And the question arises, do we give him as much as he wants? How much? I mean, and I'm, and I'm not talking really about amount as much as I'm talking about a desire to satisfy the Father, or in the case of Jesus, the desire to satisfy um, to where he would say that that's enough, that's, that has satisfied my heart? Or do we go with our strength and our, I, our desire, I'll go this far and I know that you know, should be enough. <clears throat> uh, verse 13, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. So guess what? He doesn't just give them as much as he wants. He gives them above 
what even the need is or the satisfaction is. Even above that. So guess what? You don't have to know what amount is going to satisfy the Father. You give him the Son and you give him all that, that is within you. You give him the Son and all that is within you of his life. <clears throat> so, um, I wrote, he gives above what we give. He gives above what we need. He gives above what we need, but he gives above what we give back to him, too. And we're talking about in terms of satisfaction now. Okay, We're talking about... Um, It's just really difficult to sometimes break with the concepts of giving to God because it's the, it's the Christian thing to do. Jesus says, uh, give it and it shall be given unto you. So that opens the door for all kind of wrong motives. But he says that this is his spirit. This is the way he functions. When you give, it's going to come back. And Jesus gave to the uttermost. <clears throat> All right. So verse uh, 14 and 15. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. Into a mountain himself alone. All right, so what was that statement you made during the break, Kelly, about Solomon? Maybe you should come up here because it's a scripture, right? Could you, could you just do that real quick? I'll, I just need the scripture. Yeah. Well, and you can make the comment that you asked me because I'm about to answer it. <laughs> Um, it's First Chronicles 17 and verse 13, and um, it says, "I will be his father, and he shall be my son." And it's it referring to um, Solomon building God a house, and God's telling David that that's how he's going to relate to Solomon: that I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I just said I mentioned to Randy at the break that every time I see that verse, which I've looked at it several times today, just feels like a sinkhole into something so eternal. Then I asked, is that referring to this relationship of the eternal father and the son? Yeah. That was my question. And I said, hopefully I would get into it in this class, and I did. Okay. Um, here, you, you see the answer to that right here. All right. So Jesus, um, he has fed the 5,000, and then he notices that there's still, this prior to this, it says that they were just seeking him for the miracles. So now, in verse, uh, what did we say, 14, then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, uh, said, this is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a, a mountain himself alone, a mountain himself, he's alone. This is important. This is, this is not a story. This is the reality of the heart of the son that, um, his, that there is this desire to give the father what he wants. So he's, gonna, he's about to take off on this I am the bread of life thing and eat my flesh and drink my blood. Um, but uh, in answer to Kelly's question, Okay, so the, so the father says to Solomon, I will be your father and you will be my son. Everybody else sees him as the king. Come to make a king or as a prophet. You see that? Just like Jesus, it's the, you know, it's the same deal. And the father's saying, I don't see you that way. We make such a big deal out of titles. Well, I'm a prophet. Well, I'm this. Well, I'm, you know, you know, you. 
he is what's important. And so, and I'm not even saying that there's not those offices and those places. Uh, may they be used according to Ephesians 4 in the right flow of what that's about. But, but greater than that is the Father doesn't say, you shall be my king or you shall be my prophet and you shall rule, you know, this and do that and everything. The Father says, you're going to be a son and I'm going to be your father. Desire the father. The hearts desire the father. Uh, uh, manifestation of the father. Uh, declaration by the father in the Old Testament of what was in his heart before the foundation of the world. Uh, it, it, it breaks down all of the positions. It breaks down all of the concepts of, of the kingdom of God, you, you know, translated into the kingdom of my dear son, Solomon's kingdom. You shall be a son, and I will be your father. It moves back the, 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 the stage set that's just earthly and built by men, and it opens, a, a, well, it opens the heavens where the father says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, that this, is, this son stuff is big to me. I'm the father, and I want sons in the image of Christ. We just read along, and we just have all of our little set pieces there, and we just see Solomon on the throne, and we go, oh, God's going to bless him. God's going to take care of him because he's going to be God's king. They come to Jesus, and they come and they're going to make him king. And remember, I said earlier in the last class, there is something, if you don't remember anything else, remember this. How many of you remember what it was? <laughs> Did anybody actually remember? Okay, good. Well, if you remember anything in this class, remember this. It's the same thing I asked you to remember in the other one. That we make him what we want instead of knowing him as he is. All right, so here we have an example. They've come, they, they say, this is the prophet. Or th they're going to come and they say, you're the king. So being the prophet profits us. Being the king profits us. We make him what we want. And Jesus withdraws from that and he's about to tell them what he is and how to know him as he is. Y'all remember what's coming, don't you? <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's great stuff. And he's, he, is, he is literally going to, by doing what he's about to do, rebuke everything that went forward because it didn't bring forth the intended goal. We saw it as a miracle instead of seeing our own goals to get a miracle and uh, to get what we want from the Lord, and we missed his heart, and worse to Jesus, we missed the heart of the Father, and he'll, he'll deal with that in the 20s, 21 or something like that, and start, he'll start the flow then. He's, first, he has to declare, um, he has to declare as son what kind of son, or know him as he is, what kind of son, and he's going to be, a, he's going to be the broken bread son. He's going to be the broken bread son. Broken bread. He's going to be the broken bread son. And that's, that's what we're going to have to know. That's what they didn't know. And, and he's going to have to become that if the father is going to get more sons in the image of Christ. Okay? But they can't just be sons. The royal family. We're the royal family. No, you're sons in the image of the broken bread son. Okay, so the, when the people came, 
uh, even, you know, this was before he did the miracle of the loaves and fishes. They were seeking him for the miracles. Then Jesus did that, but he had something else in his heart. And so they come and they're going to make him a prophet. They're going to make him a king. They're going to make him what they want. They're going to, they, they, we, and we tend to do this. We emphasize Jesus in areas of what we want. So if we're, well, we do think of all the different titles, you know. And we, we, this is what we want. So that's, that's how we declare him. But to declare him as he is, is not really even to declare him. It's to come into agreement with the Father. Or to declare the Father as he is, is not really our place to declare him. It's to come into agreement with the Son and his relationship with the Father. It is, it's not about us formulating anymore. It's about what's in his heart or what's in his heart, speaking of the Father or the Son. And finding that, finding that to be real and true, and once you find it, because, you know, for we know that when we see him, we shall see him as he is. When he shall appear, we shall see him as he is. So it's no, it's no longer this thing of, it's not a religion. My God, it's not a religious mental path of, I mean, the, the religious mental path um, is choking out our ability to see him as he is. It is. It is. I, and me, you, all of us, it's, it's the worst thing. It's worse than, you know, being a sinner in a sense because, you know, then you don't know beans anyway. You got more hope of coming into something, but when you, you know, you gather all this stuff, you go, hey, you know, I know stuff. And he goes, you know, I'd rather you be hot or cold. So, so we, we make him, we make him a prophet and we make him a king, but we never make him broken bread. And he's, he's, I'm, I'm going to say it like this. I'm sure this is the wrong word. He's upset. If nothing else, he's hurt. He withdraws. If nothing else, he's, you know, any, any word you could do that would say, here's what I'm about, and here's what I'm doing, and everybody, nobody sees that, and everybody's rejoicing over stuff that they shouldn't, and I just need to get away and be alone by myself. Did you, did you notice the wording there? To get alone. And he departed again, again. He departed again into a mountain himself alone. And, you know, we, we understand our loneliness. We understand, you know, when we just have to get alone or whatever. But we, how, how could we ever understand the son who wants so to fulfill the heart of the father have to get alone because nobody is really buying into it. Nobody is joining with him in this goal because they don't even know it because they're too busy making him something that he is not trying to be I'm not trying to be a king right now I'm not trying to be a prophet right now I just want to be broken bread that you take into you that you eat so like I said we make him a prophet or king but we don't make him broken bread and that for for him and the father then there's no satisfaction remember how much satisfaction he gave the 5,000 not only as much as they wanted but there was satisfaction left over for even the future how much satisfaction did he get none none in this situation all right Let's look at uh, verse 25 and 26. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou here? Jesus answered them, 
and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Now, now two times it's mentioned the miracles, but Jesus rewords that now. Is that significant? It is. Yeah, it sure is. Good. It's significant because he's taking it out of a religious context and just saying, you, you just wanted to fill your belly. It, in other words, it was, you're seeking your satisfaction. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. he, he made sure that, you know, and, and clearly they followed because of the miracles, but Jesus breaks that down and he says, okay, to you it's a miracle. To me it's you just want to fill your, your stomach with what you can eat and so that you feel satisfied. And he's, I mean, this is after he's gone up in the mountain to be alone and they hunt him down. He's going, oh, go away. You know? So he just says this to him. He just says that to him. He says, this is, don't you see what you're doing as opposed to, you know, what, what I'm here for? So, um, uh, and they just showed up, so they, here they are. They traveled far and they labored for one kind of bread, that's in the next verse, verse 27, labor not for the food which perisheth, okay? So he's saying, what is he talking about? We read that a lot of times and we say, okay, Jesus is saying I shouldn't get a job or Jesus is saying I shouldn't, you know, just work hard for, he's saying you're, the labor they're doing is in the process of seeking him, but for these other things. <coughs> and that perishes. But this relationship, if there's anything eternal, this is it. Okay, so to know this is eternal life. <laughs> Amen? To know this is eternal life. All right, so they're seeking him, but, they, but they're... Can I say it like this? They're seeking him, but they're dissatisfying him. I know that's terrible grammar, but they, they're, they are bringing him to a point of dissatisfaction over what's going on in their hearts. They're laboring. They're, I, we're seeking you. You know, we're, we're committed. <laughs> you don't know me as I am, so you're seeking me on a basis that I don't want to be sought on. I want to be sought as broken bread. <coughs> and Jesus says, labor for that bread that results in life. Labor for what results in life, not just uh, sustains you're the life that I will go to the cross and crucify. You're trying to sustain something I want to bring to death so that you might have another life, the life in the Son, and function by that. And who's the winner then? The Father. The Father. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's compare verse uh, with this. You know, he's saying labor for the bread that results in life. So let's just read verse 53 um, through 57. Okay. Uh, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. See? Remember what he said? Labor for the bread that results in life. If, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Where? In you. In you. Okay. He who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life. Because this life that the Father has with the Son, the Son has with the Father, is eternal. We've already made that, that clear. Um, He who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. I will raise him up. I will raise him up. Okay. 
This is the resurrection, folks. I am the resurrection. The Son is the resurrection and the life. This is the... I, I will raise you up at the last day. So what do we say? Oh, goody! You know, in the last days, I'm going to become a sky baby again. <laughs> you know? And he's saying, no sky babies. No. Son. Only son. I am the resurrection that you're avoiding or ignoring or misinterpreting. I am. And guess what? I'm the life. And unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're just going to be you. And you'll have to put just thoughts in your head. And you'll just have to follow what you think are the right guidelines, which everybody has something different the way they're approaching it. You know, well, this is, everybody has the same, the same. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's going to be the same for each and every person then in that context. In that context. So, um, I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. All right. Now, it sounds like He's, it, doesn't it sound a little bit like he's excited to at least say this? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the reaction to that is going to be? Negative. It's going to be negatory. That's right. Uh, but he's excited because he's here and we're out here trying to get him to be a prophet or, or a king or, you know, a magician. <laughs> I love saying that. A magician. Some of you are looking like, I don't even know what that is. That's because I made it up. Um, verse 56, he that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in them. All are in him. That's it right there. That's the I in you and you in me. That's the I, you know, you go, well, what does that mean? Abide in him and him in me. This is it. You take in him and when you do, then he dwells in you. you. Okay, here he is out here, okay? Here he is. Where is he at now? He's in you. And you are in him because you've been brought into this that's going to flourish. It's going to, it's going to flourish toward the father and the husbandman the father, I am the vine, you are the branches, my father is the husband, and the husband and the father will come and he gathers in the fruit of that union of I and you and you and me. Uh, John 15, he he's, the one, he's the one that gets to gather the fruit of it, the smell, the taste of it, and go, this is what I wanted. And there's a satisfaction that is eternal in John 15 instead of just, well, the doctrine says I should abide in him, so I'm going to stay a Christian. You know, and the angels just go, yeah, that's really, you missed it, buddy. Yeah, <laughs> this is not it at all. Um, and then finally, verse 57. Um, and the living Father hath sent me. Ooh. And the living Father hath sent me. Now, here's, here's one thing to recognize. This, he's trying to get a living thing going here, not a doctrinal teaching. See, he's, he wants something living, and he wants that living like this, so that there's no difference between the Father and the Son in the sense of their heart and their flow, but one's the Father and one's the Son. And one is giving in that relationship, and one is receiving out of it, just as that changes with the flow of the Holy Spirit and the, the addition of the movement of that. Living Father... But the next thing is, sent me. All right. This is, I mean, our time's running out. Well, since you haven't remembered, if you remember anything, then remember this, since you've already forgotten the things. Um, 
this little phrase, the Father sent me. Oh, you're going to be shocked and amazed and joy, overjoyed to find out what that means. Because all we make it mean is, well, I guess God sent Jesus. Because he said it. But here, the Father sent him. And it's that same desire. The Father's not just going, huh, I think I'll just send you down there. No, everything is with purpose. Remember, we saw that when it, it was on Passover and Jesus goes, okay, you're going to get the real Passover lesson, the eternal one, today. See, because nothing's without purpose with him. He doesn't just randomly do stuff. The reason why we're confused when he does stuff that we think is random is because we don't understand as he is and we don't understand this relationship and we don't understand that Jesus is going to mess with you until he gets you flowing with him in this. And the Holy Spirit's going to mess with you until he gets you flowing with the bride toward the son. And, he's go and it's all going to be with purpose. And we'll go, well, why did this happen? Or why did they do that? See, we go, they. What? We go, well, God isn't random, but Randy sure is. Well, guess what? In God's movements, he will use all things toward, toward that end, okay? So, um, let's see. We were in verse 26 and 27. Go back there. <clears throat> um, verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me. You do seek me, not because... You saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled, labor not for the food which perishes, but for that food which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. The Son gives to you. That's what this is saying. The Son is the one who is giving to you. The Son gives to you. But the Father has made the son the vehicle for sons. He has sealed this. this is, see how this arrow goes this direction? Well, guess what? This, this arrow from the son to the father and the arrow pointing to the father from the son, it also goes this way. And the father says, this is my beloved son. Now, if we're going to talk about sons, you're going to have to be in son. Okay. I've sealed it. This is settled. This is not going to change. <laughs> When God seals it, man, it's sealed. Yeah. You know, puts his seal on it, close that thing. You know how that wax in those days, it would melt on there and you weren't supposed to open it unless, you know, this is sealed and settled with God. It's, the sun is going to be the entry point into the desires of the heart of the Father. And so, so, so Jesus, if Jesus said something like this, you need to know me, we, would, we could go, well, you're talking about yourself. But what if he says, you need to know me because I'm the entry point in what God has sealed and I'm the, I'm the only way. Uh, and, and really, I'm the only truth. And really, I'm the life. And no man comes to the... But by me, I'm it. I'm it. There's not going to be another. There's not. You, there's not another way that you can enter in. I'm the door. I'm the entry point. And of course, and I will be the fulfillment of the heart <laughs> desire of the Father. Maybe we should stop. All right, let me excuse me while I just take a second. If I don't do this, I will never remember what's going on here. I don't even remember where I finished last class. Let's see. I think, yes, I do. I do. Yeah, I remember now. 
is this class number eight right now? Is that what's behind me? Is it sneaking up on me? Y'all are funny. Is it about to grab me? Am I going to be destroyed? Good. Yes, the cross will do that to me. Father, we just thank you for your movement. The, the, the dove is here. The dove will show us Jesus as he is. And Jesus as he is will show us the Father. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah for the eternality of it all. Hallelujah to be swallowed up of life, like it says in Corinthians. Swallowed up of life. Father, we just thank you. We believe that even if our minds don't remember everything, even if, even if there was the possibility that tons of stuff was shared in these last two classes that could transform our thinking and our life, if we remember none of it, they are still seeds. And, and Lord, we just pray that the Holy Spirit will water those seeds. And that it's not about grasping the concepts that have come out of the teacher's mouth. It's about can the spirit move on our heart during this? And can we say, oh, Father, I long that you be satisfied and I'm sorry for my many blindnesses that have kept me from you. Father, can we... Can we pray that and you hear it and can your dove come land on Christ in us? Can he begin to show the sun in us? May we not think the Holy Spirit is on us to make us gifted or anointed, but the dove lands on us to identify that Christ is there in us. May we quit perverting things and in so doing, cutting out you, Jesus, and you, Father, and even making the Holy Spirit something that he is not there for. Even as Eliezer was down in Haran and they wanted him to stay and bring more gifts and do more stuff for the for the people there and he said no I'm taking a bride back to the sun I'm leaving this place and this land and I'm going back to where the father is from that sent me and where the sun is help us to see hearts of deity hearts of the living God the living father we ask in Jesus name Amen. We're just...